Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our respected faculties and all the doctors who've connected both from India and abroad for Olympics fifth webinar on knowledge beyond boundaries. I am Atul Suri and I represent Olympic Pharmaceuticals. We are a 113 year old Indian pharma company and I have the singular honor of welcoming our eminent panelists and respected participants to this international webinar. We at Alembic have always been at the forefront when it comes to knowledge sharing initiatives. We truly believe that knowledge is boundless and needs to be shared across the globe. Through this initiative, Alembic has brought to you renowned international and national faculties who shared their perspective and experiences on various topics of interest to gynecologists. Today, Alembic brings to you the fifth in the series of Knowledge Beyond Boundaries on the theme endometriosis, piecing the jigsaw puzzle with the saber of laser and cases. We are indeed privileged to have with us a speaker of international repute who's beaming in all the way from Atlanta, from the Nizhat Medical Center, none other than the man himself, Dr. Siana Nizhat. To introduce him and our other special panelists to you all, I will request our moderator for the webinar today, Dr. Niranjan Chavan, to do the works. I, of course, will have the singular honor, like every time, of introducing Dr. Niranjan Chauhan to all of you. And I must say, it is the easiest job for me because you all know him so well. But things must be done. And so I shall speak about Dr. Niranjan for a minute. He, of course, is a professor and the unit chief at the Sign Hospital here at Mumbai. He's the national coordinator, Foxy Medical Disorders and Pregnancy Committee, 19 right through, right through till 2021. The vice president of MOGS 2021, the premises secretary AFG 1920. He's also been the chairperson of Foxy Oncology and TT committees 2012 till 2014. There is so much more about Dr. Chavan that I can tell you all about, but in the interest of time, I must hand you over to him to moderate the sessions. Over to you, Dr. Chavan. Thank you, Atul Suri, sir. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. What a journey it has been. From London to Spain, from Spain to Brazil, and from Brazil, we go back to US. We have had many, many stalwarts who have embellished this platform. But today, we have with you, the god of lasers in endometriosis, none other than the Nezad brother, Dr. Siena Nezad, is come all the way live from Atlanta, Georgia, and I had the opportunity to meet him in person in 2015 when he landed in Mumbai at the AAGL conference. But I will have to also mention Dr. Cameron Nezat, who I first met in 1997 when I took that diploma of five days and along with the other expert endoscopist and laparoscopist, I saw myself the lasers being used and that was amazing phenomenal. And here we have his brother and sir, Dr. Siena Nezat with us. But before that honors to be done by Dr. Adi Dastur, sir, I would like to introduce my esteemed panelist. So I call upon Dr. Professor Narendra Malotra, who doesn't know him, but it is an honor to introduce him. He is a father of ultrasound. And he runs courses from Agra, the beautiful city of Taj Mahal. He is the director of Ian Donald School, a professor of Sarajevo School of Science and Technology. We all know him, his efforts and hard work in Foxy, in his path, in his art, in Zafog, as the president and vice president. He is also the member of FIGO Guidelines Committee. And he runs courses which are so loved. Pan India and the world. Thank you, Professor Narendra Malhotra, to join us today. 
well thank you we have with us dr nozar sheriyar sir we all know him as the secretary general of foxy where he is so humble and so good natured but i have to mention him that he was the past president of emojis presently practices at bridge candy hindu jakar holy family hospital he was a scientific chair of the 22nd figo congress rio de janeiro delivered 16 orations 500 presentations and he is also the frcog honoris causa edited five books published 33 papers i can go on and on but most importantly he has got and he is being the member of the technical advisory group who southeast asian region and the member board of gachmar institute i pass and c3 welcome dr nozar sheria sir <coughs> well i would like to introduce our last panelist the last is the best and she is none other than dr manjula anagani from south india she is a padma shri she has got many awards to her credit presently she is practicing in hyderabad at the medicover hospitals and she is a visiting laparoscopic surgeon to dubai her field of interest is minimal invasive surgery and we are going to hear from us how to tackle aub today she also has got many publications to her credit and has been awarded the legion in the field of gynecology by the times healthcare achievers 2018 award welcome dr manjula and the icing on the cake is our own mogs trusty our own foxy vice president past and he is also the emeritus editor of journal of obstetrics and gynecology of india none other than dr adi dastoor he was the dean of neurology wadia maternity and the state gs medical college mumbai and a professor honorary in the same hospital along with that he practices at bharti hospital bridge candy hospital and we know him is love for academics as he was the dean of indian college of obstetrics and gynecology and also the past president of college of physician and surgeon now i call upon dr adi dastoor sir to be with us and before i pass on this mic we are happy to announce the support from luminous as well it is a global leader in the field of minimal invasive clinical solutions for the surgical ophthalmological and aesthetic markets that is how they have brought tiana nazar sir today in front of all of you the audience welcome dr adi dastoor please go ahead and introduce cnn azad sir thank you niranjan for those kind words and the lovely introductions where do i begin to tell the story of the three illustrious brothers the three brothers neja we call them the three musketeers because they always slash out their sabers of laser and they go and do the impossible now there are different people in this universe and this world but these three brothers have made it their ambition and their science to change the course of surgery the art the science and the geography of surgery why do i say geography not because they flowed down from the land of persia the land of plenty to the us that's not a trump the reason i say geography is because we are used to the 50 by 50 square feet operation theaters big air conditioned and whatever but what the these are brothers they've done their desire was to go inside the cavity of the body and operate with small laser beams with small instruments and they found the cavity somewhere they would go inside so they went in the abdominal cavity the pelvic cavity then they told their colleagues okay, let's go in the heart and let's go in the chest and let's go in the lungs and let's go in the brain and they went every possible for example if you want to do a spinal surgery they would make a space in the muscles of the back inflated put in small instruments put in a small laser beam put in an obturator repair the spinal defect 
put the muscles back into place quietly and come back and the patient goes to work after two days so i mean they've changed really what the surgical scene is all about they've changed it into a mini or in the human body and introducing small minute inst- uh, instruments small laser beams to perform the magical surgeries and cure the patient to normalcy with this they showed how the laparoscopic techniques only require a vision and everything else can be done and for this i think i'm postulating that alfred nobel will always think of them when he thinks of his nobel prize for medicine because nobody has changed medicine so drastically in at least uh, the last last couple of decades i mean they have done something which is totally irreplaceable and totally exacting and uh, we should really appreciate this now the three brothers are all you can't say who's a b- bigger genius a cameron is cameron he is the god and he is the god and he is the guy who is on the cover of time magazine and cover of newsweek magazine and and he is the one who predicted in 19 early 1990s that nobody's going to open the abdomen and tummy for surgery or make big incisions everybody is going to go through with your camera route they will bend down over the patient and do a laparoscopy they will sit back stand up see the tv screen and majestically do the surgery or robotic surgery or whatever they are used to while soft music is playing in the background they are looking at the screen they are operating quickly and before you know and before the song is over the surgery is over so i mean they really changed the scene i've seen them operate and, uh, my wife naina sister was operated by carmen years ago when uh, i think even before sena came to atlanta and uh, she said that i have not seen a, ma- a maverick and a genius like this gentleman as in actually he is a persian so and she didn't like that so ultimately the more i speak to you about them the less they can speak so with these few words it's my great pleasure today to request our guest speaker sena nazar from the atlanta institute to present his talk today on laparoscopic surgery with lasers with precision sena please take over thank you very very much for all of you uh, your kind introduction i am humbled beyond the words but it is a true pleasure to be with you all and i see friends just could feel the good vibe coming from all of our colleagues around the india i always remember the hospitality we have welcome many of you in our operating room in the past and i hope it starts again and you come back but it is a pleasure to be with you today uh, I bring you greetings from my brothers that we all have been with you and have had the best time but I like to go ahead and share with you my experience I do work with these companies mainly on teaching and product development no conflict related to my talk and also like to thank my fellows residents students and assistant for helping me with this presentation today video assisted laparoscopy is pretty much anthracoscopy is pretty much used in all cavities in the body as i did you mention whenever there is a cavity in the body or a cavity can be created video assisted surgery is peripheral but when we talk about endometriosis unfortunately it varies from center to center and person to person and the reason is we do not yet have a specialty or some specialty with focus on endometriosis for cancer for maternal fetal for the adolescent okay. pediatric we have some specialty urogynecology 
So right now, endometriosis is left in the hand of everyone. And that has a limiting factor. And the reason is when endometriosis is in the certain part of the body, like such as bladder, bowel, ureter, major blood vessels, it usually is left untreated or undertreated, which is okay, but unfortunately sometimes it is improperly treated, which could lead to complications. It is important that we give the best treatment to our patient. To give you a summary background, you all know about endometriosis, and the reason I like to share this video with you is to let you know that endometriosis pretty much is a whole body disease. It's not just limited to the reproductive organ. This is right lower quadrant abdominal wall, you could see the terminal ileum. It's fused to the abdominal wall with adhesion, fibrosis, causing partial obstruction. But by the time this patient gets this treatment, here is the appendix fused to the cecum. And <clears throat> this could cause a lot of GI symptoms. The last person that this person, uh, Diagnosed her is somebody in our center. You can see endometriosis on the left hemidaphrag, paracardium, pericardium, and endometriosis invades the ureter, bladder on different levels. So this is extra ureteral disease. So whenever we are looking for endometriosis. It is important to assess the entire abdomen and look for the whole area. Now, what I like to say is these patients normally see gastroenterologists, they see urologists, and all of these work are done before they come to us. If we could catch these patients before in early stages, then it would be very helpful. So I'd like to introduce to you, this is a Nejad Endometriosis Advisory app. It is free downloadable from Apple Store, and we give it to all the patients. It's a simple questionnaire. And they, with the more than 90% accuracy, these patients could be suspected, highly suspected for endometriosis without any surgery. Now, as far as the CO2 laser and endometriosis, <clears throat> I'd like to share with you my personal view and experience. But I do believe it is reproducible by proper training, and it comes a day that we will have a global application specifically when it comes to the treatment of endometriosis. Taking you back in early 80s, Cameron, my brother, started working with video laser laparoscopy. And that's the, if you look at the literature, introduction of the video is the one that became the foundation of today's minimally invasive surgery in all disciplines, because we take advantage of the video magnification. In 1985, he introduced his, and presented his experience at Fertility and Sterility and Society of Reproductive Medicine, and he stated that even the advanced stages of endometriosis could be treated with video laser laparoscopy with good results. And whenever we can treat the most severe endometriosis, pretty much <clears throat> anything else can be done. As you all know, endometriosis at times could present itself worse than even cancer. But there are two caveats here. It requires a skill and experience, which depends on the knowledge of the anatomy and proper instrumentation. So 
video assisted endoscopy regardless of robot no robot in any part of the body it is not cutting and sewing anymore it requires energies so i'd like to invite you to download these books for free online and it has written our experience it shares with you ex our experience our data and all our publication for your reference I would not show you literature here. I would focus mainly on surgery and technical aspect. There are a lot going on about vaporization, coagulation, and excision. <clears throat> elimination, excuse me, elimination of endometriosis could be done with excision, which is bulk cutting and removing or vaporization which is going layer by layer in a micro surgical principle it requires experience it requires proper instrumentation location and the depth of penetration is the key factor here i'd like to share with you on the same patient vaporization and excision the goal is complete removal of the pathology this is the uterus posterior cul-de-sac this is the pararectum uterosacral ligament this is an infiltrative nodule but the surrounding tissue are fatty tissue we are away from the bowel away from the ureter major blood vessel and in the posterior cul-de-sac chances of a scar tissue formation is significantly less because there is no organ who could get stuck to it except the uterus but when we look at the side wall this is a right pelvic side wall this is the ureter and you see this is small superficial lesions but they do not need to be excised anymore simply it could be vaporized and you can get the same result I have some reservation about over popularizing excision. I'm, and I mentioned, unfortunately, some area is improperly treated. This is at YouTube. You can go on YouTube and download some of these videos. These are the ones that my fellows share with us. This is a right fallopian tube, right ovary. This is a robotic. This is a monopolar tip which has up to seven millimeters depth of penetration and these small superficial lesions are being excised and the tube is traumatized i mean this tube will look so beautiful i look at it i kind of start feeling sorry for that tube excising these lesions from the sensitive area like a fallopian tube it could traumatize it the tube is open it's fine but this is this tube is damaged if you go in the posterior cul-de-sac tiny tiny spot right here can't even see it if you don't pay attention this is the rectum being pulled up and this is being excised which is fine this area if it's done properly is not as traumatic this is the end of the tube it still has endometriosis and it could simply be excised so in my teaching with my fellows i will I'll tell them precision without traumatizing the tube and the ovary is important. This is the fimbriated end of the left fallopian tube. This is a paratubal cyst, another one. And this area was endometriosis attached to the right uterosacral ligament. So this area is separated. And you can see that simply separating for healthy from unhealthy tissue and creating a plane with maximum precision no significant thermal damage to the tube and the lesion could be excised without traumatizing the tube and if there are spots here simply could be vaporized 
And I'm not going to bore you for showing and telling you all about of this. As you know, we every Saturday, <clears throat> last Saturday of every month, at, 10, at 1 o'clock Atlanta time, we invite different panels to come and share their experience. And I'd like to invite any of you who is interested to participate in these panels, to write to us, it would be an honor to invite you, talk about it, share your experience, and let the people know how things are done in your area. As far as energy sources, there are variety available. If we choose CO2 laser, it's because of precision and safety. People ask me if I don't have a CO2 laser, what I would use. With CO2 laser, I would need an additional bipolar for larger vessel hemostasis. Ultrasonic is the closest you could get to precision when you talk about endometriosis. But then I like the Tande beat, which is a combination of bipolar, high frequency, and also the ultrasonic energy. So it gives me versatility of using one instrument for multiple purpose. You can access this online, energy sources, choices, and the, and the risk and benefit involved with each one. Monopolar electrosurgery has the highest risk of depth of penetration. Bipolar is more superficial. But when it comes to the CO2 laser, Except for poor hemostatic effect on large vessel, it has excellent results comparing to any other devices. Showing you side by side here, this is scissors, you can look at it. This is using monopolar for this superficial lesion, scissors for this lesion, plasma jet, and a CO2 laser. I'm going to play simultaneously. And you can see it for yourself, the difference that the scissors could be more bulky. The monopolar could be used with precision. However, there is more lateral thermal spirit. We have to be careful because this is like a hot knife and this is the right pelvic sidewall and the ureter and major blood vessel. And requires a lot of dexterity, but it does work on capillary for hemostasis. Now there are plasma jet introduced. Actually, I published the first experience when it comes to the plasma jet. It's a good energy source for a wider surface area, like a miliary endometriosis, or I published it, I used it for a what we call it mossy endometriosis. But for the small precision area, you could have wider spread lateral thermal damage. If we want to ablate the base of the ovarian cyst, plasma jet would be good, or for debulking of the endometriosis on the surface, large surface area like the diaphragm. But the CO2 laser, in combination with hydrodissection, gives you the most precise access with the least amount of thermal spirit, and it can be used as a free beam or a fiber. We can excise the lesion without concern about damage to the underlying tissue. And when we have spirit tissues all around those tiny spots, it could be simply vaporized and get the same results. So this is a side-by-side -side comparison for this. I do like to re-emphasize the concern about using monopolar energy. In 1978, they banned it for a period of time. And now, even in 1998, we still get warning from FDA and societies because of the capacitation and the sparking and improper use. 
So that's why it's important that CO2 laser is superior because it is a light amplification and it is from the surface down. So what you see is what you get. We go in a microsurgical principle in sub-millimeter bites, layer by layer, we could go down and minimal lateral thermal spread. And it gives the surgeon a lot of versatility. Free beam versus fiber laser. There are a lot of fiber lasers are like YAG, KTP, there some newer newer ones are coming. But they all of them they have a different amplification, so they have more depth of penetration. The fiber CO2 laser has the same qualification of a free beam, but it gives the people the ability to use both hands, having a camera person, if you have a beam, then you is attached to your operative scope and you have to use your right or dominant hand as a cutting device. As far as the fiber razor is, this is a fiber using the lysis of adhesion. This is the tube, this is the bowel. It could be done by the conventional video laparoscopy. And you can see it here is very nice superficial cutting. And this is the fiber separating the bowel from the adhesion without concern of damaging the bowel. But my preference when it comes to using a fiber laser is with the robotic. You can see here, this is the uterus, this is the sigmoid colon, left tube and the ovary. It is very nice and reproducible easily. I can teach this to my fellows and residents how to create a plane, identify normal from abnormal anatomy. Then I can tell them, for example, if we want to use the hydrodissection, the beauty of a CO2 laser is that it does not penetrate to the water, to the liquid. So hydrodissection creates a safe backstop for us. So here, when I want to work and separate this bowel, we inject the fluid, and you can see here, it creates space for me. And then, with safety, the CO2 fiber laser could help to go ahead, separate this attachment from the back of the uterus working on the top of the rectosigmoid and going down. Now I show you this one with the robotic, but this could be used with conventional video laparoscopy also. Actually, I like the fiber laser during video laparoscopy because it even fits to room my three millimeter ports and it works for the area. But you can see here, we push the bowel laterally. This is the serosa, this is the uh, bowel mesentery. This is the back of the uterus. And you can see in the most microsurgical principle, <clears throat> we can separate this. And when it comes close to the tubes and the ovaries, the same area as you can see here, easily could be separated from the ovary without concern of too much thermal damage to the ovary or the fallopian tube. When it comes to this uh, endometriosis, I will show you three different areas simultaneously. This is on the right pararectal and posterior cul-de-sac area, very similar to what I showed you in the beginning. We can excise with it. <clears throat> this is on the surface of the left uterosacral ligament. The ureter is here. 
and that it can be used for excision, vaporization, without concern of deep penetration and damage to the nerve or underlying tissue. So as I mentioned, the goal is complete elimination of visible and palpable lesions, restore the anatomy, preserve the function, and of course when it comes to fertility, enhance the fertility. How to decide on the approach? It depends, as I mentioned, on the location, depth of the lesion, and the patient's desire with symptoms and uh, what the outcome they expect to be. For example, on infertility patients, we have a different approach than in the pain patient. If we use the bowel, for example, we, take, we categorize the bowel lesion above the sigmoid colon, on the sigmoid colon, on the rectovaginal, on the rectum, etc. And again, here, for example, I'd like to show you this case of a sigmoid colon that she has a large lesion. And that is actually one of my cases that we do a virtual colonoscopy on these patients. And you can see the nodule and a lot, this large segment of the bowel is plastered to each other. So initial approach, when we look at it, you see the small lesion. This is the left uterus sacral, left pelvic sidewall, but this is the actual lesion. And because this is one of my earlier cases that fiber laser was not available, <coughs> I use free beam for this. Now, this is the fibrotic area who surrounds the bowel, and we can go the same level between the bowel lesion and ceromasularis of the bowel and with small spots as i mentioned this is a sub millimeter cut at time and a large piece of the nodule on the bowel is removed and from here to here you can see the bowel anatomy is restored Today we have the technology of a spy system that we can evaluate the bowel integrity, bowel muscularities. It could help us identify healthy from unhealthy tissue. During the sigmoidoscopy, you see there is no thermal damage, no problem, no lesion, no problem in the bowel. And externally, when we distend the bowel, we can see it is thin but intact and we examine the bowel under the water. And it's better to leave this. As it is, it would heal properly, and this case is doing great. All of her bowel symptoms have resolved. So CO2 laser and hydrodissection, it gives us margin of safety or in the sensitive area. It is per size, minimal thermal tissue damage, and it has the capillary hemostatic. Parodissection separates the peritoneum, protects the underlying, and prevents from laser beam, and intentionally damaging the other organs. So I have a few cases of ureter for you. This is the first laparoscopic, video laparoscopic ureter reanastomosis reported in the world by Cameron and Farr, my brothers, in 1992. And since then, until today, we follow the same principle. And this is one of my cases that you can see on the IVP. She has a stricture, hydroureter on the left side. So what we have to do first is free the adhesion. This is the left ureter, hydro ureter, left ovary, left fallopian tube. The hydrodissection separates healthy from unhealthy tissue. It gives me a precise location to separate the ovary, 
although the large segment of the parayuretal Lux disease, but it's not. By separating it, mobilizing the ureter, you can see that all of these healthy part of the ureter are healthy. Only a small portion is called constriction, and this is the part that needs resection and reanastomosis. If we had gone just by the IVP, urologists would like to cut it here and do ureteral reimplantation. You can see the capillarity is good. We have mobilized the ureter. The principles of the ureter surgery is to avoid devascularization, mobilize to allow reapproximation without tension, and when we suture it, we like to approximate without strangulation. So you see we have a healthy bleeding, these are small bleeders, we don't stop and let the suture at six o'clock, this is the ureter and the stent, then this is a four OPDS, left and right, so one at six, one at three and nine, and the last one is at 12. And from here, we have gone to here, and these patients are for a long-term follow-up. But when the lesion is on the surface area of the ureter, there is no need to be too aggressive about it. Again, this is the right ureter. These are the scattered miliary type in different stages of endometriotic lesion. This is clear lesion, red lesion, fibrotic lesion. And all of these, it could be hydrodissected, vaporized in certain area. But when you reach a part that it is not superficial, here you can see by get the peritoneum, by pulling it, the ureter, which is here, is also pulled. So this is the area that we like to go deeper remove all the fibrotic area. And this is the excision on the top of the ureter. So if the excision is done properly, the whole lesion is removed with surrounding healthy tissue. You can see the ureter, these are the capillary, blood vessel, and no trauma to the ureter. That is why when we look at the literature, you see the incidence of urinary tract endometriosis is between one to 16%. Why up to 16%? Because if we go and cut the whole piece, I mentioned it, it would come back endometriosis. However, majority of these lesions are paravesical or paraureteral. So in 1996, we published our first series of endometriotic lesion involving the ureter and the bladder, and we brought into the attention that not all the lesions are necessarily invading and is called intrinsic lesion. This is a case here that by IVP, you could see a large segment of the ureter is constricted. This is a hydroureter, and we have Four different options here, resection and reanastomosis, reimplantation, transposition because of the high location, or ureterolysis. You could see here the area of the dilatation. Now I'd like to tell you that the entire video of this procedure is seven minutes. I just published it on fertility and sterility, and I have a 15 years follow-up, that one was 14 years follow-up on this patient that her ureter is normal and it has healed very nicely. So I'll just show you a one minute clip here. This is a sigmoid colon, left ovary. And as you see here, this is paraureteral fibrotic lesion in a large segment that we saw it on the IVP. Again, principle of the hydrodissection going in between the ureter and the lesion. This is very similar to the part that I showed you 
on the sigmoid all the way down to the rectosigmoid. A big nodule is shaved off of the surrounding the ureter that it was actually choking the ureter in this area and the lesion is excised you can see it here and I recommend to download the video from fertility and sterility it shows all the steps and it's a great practice and that's the final outcome 14 years later her IVP was normal and the last thing I'd like to share with you is the infertility patient with endometrioma and the fallopian tube. This is the left tube and the ovary with endometrioma. And as you can see here, this is the sigmoid, pull it up, lift the uterus, that's the right fallopian tube, healthy, open, in a good shape, but the left one, is attached, this is the left uterosacral ligament, left pelvic sidewall, rectovaginal septum. This is attached and the tube is blocked with a distal obstruction. You could see the fimbria. This is the left pararectal is pulled up here. So the best approach and is lifting, looking behind the ovary, and you can see superficial endometriotic lesion on the cortex of the ovary. So there are three steps here. One, removing the ovarian cyst without traumatizing the ovary. This is a hydrodissection, diluted petrescine on a spinal needle, and then one small superficial cut with the CO2 laser, without compromising the blood supply because this is small capillary CO2 laser stops it. Majority of this cyst would be inoculated without any energy. So this is a type 2C endometrioma that the base of it is fibrotic and is adhered to the ovarian area. So precisely here, this fibrotic area is separated with CO2 laser, you can see. So if it doesn't peel, easily is cut with CO2 laser, the cortical lesions are vaporized and irrigated. And then the cyst is completely removed. There are residual adhesion of the two fibria to the end of the to the ovary, which easily is separated with maximum precision. And then the ovarian lumen is approximated with this is a four OPDS, intracortical. I do not use any other energy, bipolar or monopolar or anything else on this ovary and base. And that's why we have not had any ovarian failure because it's the least traumatic, no energy is used, and only the edges are reapproximated without using any strangulation or extra force. And there are a few spots on the cortex of the right ovary that then in the same way is vaporized. There are diaphragmatic endometriosis that I have published it. You can refer to it. If you need any of the, well, let me just show you a little bit on the diaphragm. If you go on YouTube and download robotic diaphragmatic endometriosis, you could see videotape of some dangerous procedures on the left hemidiaphragm that my fellow shared with me. Superficial lesions like this on the diaphragm, they are better served by vaporizing them. And we published our experience in the first group in 1998. That again is in the references. I do not recommend too aggressive cutting deep, especially on the center of the diaphragm, which is the thinnest area on a patient's and then ending up having suturing or putting a mesh, etc. Easily these lesions could be
vaporized with the same principle. I've talked about CO2 laser. I still believe it is the best energy source when it comes to treatment of endometriosis. The cost, because of you have to buy the machine, initially is expensive, but it's in the long term, if you compare it to other disposable instruments, the cost would subsidize itself. The training, of course, is very important. It would require eye and hand coordination and precision. And as I mentioned, it would require additional hemostatic agents like bipolar for the larger vessels. It also requires trained team. And I'm grateful to my team in the operating room that they have everything get ready, prepared for us. Some of you have been in the OR, and this is Leon who has been with me for more than 20 years, and these are my other assistants and fellows that right now they are, this is my fellow, and this is my other assistant. So in summary, CO2 laser in reproductive surgery and in any type of surgery, as long as we like to use the microsurgical principle, is versatile, it is advantageous, very precise, and it can be used both with laparoscopy, laparotomy, that I doubt too many people do it anymore, and robotically. I also like to ask you to share with your patient to become advocates for themselves, we have created Endomarch, which is advocating patients' involvement, caring about themselves. So on that line, I do like thank you again for this opportunity to be with you, and I'm open to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful presentation and the way you have explained us from the beginning how you started endometriosis surgery in 1985, where you published the first paper in fertility, sterility, to summarize, and so gracious that you are an encyclopedia in endometriosis, nothing less than the god of lasers, to give free online Nezad books and the wonderfully latest and the recent launched the Nezat Endometriosis Advisory app with a QR code. The best things which you are doing for this women with an endo march, and I have been a witness to them. Last year, we had Camera Nezat and Maharashtra chapter of Indian Association of Gynecological Endoscopist had a wonderful lecture by Sir. And today, we are mesmerized and inspired by your wonderful lecture, you not only covered the comparison of CO2 laser with monopolar plasma jet and the normal cautery, but you explained it so nicely. And the precision of laser surgery is amazing, not only in ovarian endometriomas, but in sigmoid colon, which you had that paper, and also the obstructed ureter of 1992. And wonderfully, you are shown the ureter or ureterostomy. Sir, we are enthralled by your speech and your beautiful videos and the excellent precision of CO2 laser. And what a genius you are. We would love to see you in future too for our courses. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm humble. You are very kind. Thank you so much. Now we will take few questions with you, sir. And before that, I would request you to please stop sharing your slides so that we can go ahead with few questions and we can start the discussion. Well, TOG webinars have achieved a landmark and they are nothing less than the number one platform, Pan India. And this is the benchmark, benchmark slide where in 2020 webinars, we have crossed more than 90 webinars and 88% of the registrants are there and see the conversion 
94% of them registered live presently in this week and you can see the wonderful pie diagram which is there can i have the next slide please and it tells you that the viewership and the attendees have an average viewer time of 51 minutes and the login curves they are from 2500 to 3600 and see the average attendiveness time well the ratings the ratings in the quality of discussion the panelists the moderators the consistency is nothing less than more up to 4.5 to 5 and i want to say much except that we do a lot to ensure that we have the best and we prove it time and again by getting the best we have wonderful discussions waiting for you sir and we would like to ask you a few questions i would request dr adi sir if he can just join us and ask you questions or dr narendra malhotra and the wonderful panelists which are there eager to interact with you dr manjula anagani dr adi sir dr narendra malhotra and nozer you can please unmute your mics and please go ahead to ask few questions to sir thank you what about adding medical treatment before or after your laser surgery sorry my friend repeat it medical treatment suppression before surgery or after surgery absolutely excellent question endometriosis as i mentioned is a whole body disease and because we see one lesion in one area it doesn't mean that there are in, not in the other area so definitely medical suppression after surgery is very common in my practice I don't get the patients before the surgery so most of the patients who come to me they come for surgery with the prior diagnosis and there are on suppression now some people would say okay give them lupron or a gnrh analog before surgery in certain cases when there is active inflammatory endometriosis it may decrease the inflammation but then because it creates the fibrosis it may make the surgery a bit harder so in summary medical suppression very common after the surgery is preferable before the surgery on a limited cases dr adi yes we have an excellent presentation we have to keep the light and can you hear me yeah can thank you very much we have a lovely presentation and i think the videos are really to be classified as you know absolutely super so they are very well done and the the open reception was just so smooth across the field that you felt that you are really expert my question to you is how do you decide in the case of severe endometriosis, you're going to use a carbon dioxide laser to detect. So then you can use a robot for this case or not use a robot for this case. Well, if you noticed when I showed you the sigmoid, large sigmoid lesion, we I were going to do the robot, but <laughs> the CO2 laser was not strong and adequate enough. And there is no safe energy source with the robotic. The harmonic is not good. The monopolar is too dangerous to do that technique. So in my experience, conventional video laparoscopy is superior to the robotic for certain disease like the ureter and the bowel I showed you. But at the same time, it's a good enabler to teach the next generation how to do more of a dexterity. So it has to come on individual cases. Excellent. That's a lovely answer you given because I see exactly similarly that you have to make up your mind which for that detection will suit you with your experience and with the depth of penetration of the detection because the laser has a, its own way of detecting 
and the way you are rejecting people is falling off from the tissues. It was so beautifully done. But I think that case was with your manually, not with the robot, which you show. And that was lovely. The section was very, very nice. That's very impressive. Right. Excellent Thank work. You. Thank Sir, you. I would like to ask something. Um, it was a fantastic presentation, like everybody said. But my point is, most of the time, in infertility, they come for infertility, and when we go inside, is the time when we see real surprises. Then, how do you exactly, when and when it comes to endometriosis, this is one disease where we, where we talk about see and treat. There is no question of limiting ourselves because the endometriosis is a progressive disease. So, how do you exactly counsel them? Because we do know when we have to go little aggressive surgery, it is associated with sometimes the complications which we have not counseled them before when they are when we are going in for infertility. So how do you exactly counsel them? Excellent, excellent question. If on the publications that I referred you, we actually published our paper about twenty years ago. We call it fertility sparing surgery with invasive endometriosis. So when we go and look and we find a lesion, for example, on the diaphragm, on a patient who has no symptom, I wouldn't touch it. I can touch it. I can resect the diaphragm and repair it, but I wouldn't touch it because the patient has no symptom. And I will tell her that you do have endometriosis of the diaphragm. You may need surgery in the future, but... Medical management is fine, but for fertility patient, it is not always endometriosis progressive. I like to tell you about 25% of the time it could be regressive, especially after a spontaneous pregnancy. Now, pregnancy with IVF and ovarian hyperstimulation, unfortunately, could stimulate the endometriosis also. So to answer your question, you go and you find incidental bowel lesion, I wouldn't touch it. I would tell her, I fix the tubes, fix the ovaries, uterus is in good shape, you have a nodule on your bowel, we're gonna watch it, you may need surgery. If I remove it, you may get abscess, fistula, and compromise the condition of your tube and the ovary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nozer, can you have your question, please? Dr. Nozer, I think we have lost him. Or, uh, yes. So, uh, sir, we have one question for you, and uh, we will go ahead. There is one lady, Dr who has asked and she is having an issue about a ureteral endometriosis. This is Dr. Lakshmi and she is asking that in this patient with ureteral endometriosis, it has caused ureteral obstruction and hydronephrosis on one side. So can you please give us the plan of treatment in this case, sir? Yeah. Very good. Uh the ureter could have three parts involved. One is superficial over the ureter. One, it could be para-ureter. And then one, it could be intrinsic ureter. So I show you two cases of hydro-ureter and hydronephrosis. One was constricted, intrinsic, that required resection and reanastomosis. The other one was parauretral area that I showed you it requires ureteralysis, leaving the stent for six weeks. So in my practice, I always do uret, almost always, and always is only for that. Almost always do ureteralysis, restore the anatomy, get to the lesion, I am ready if it needs resection and reanastomosis, but more than 95% of the time, they do not require. Actually, intrinsic ureteral endometriosis incidence is less than 1%. So I recommend 
do ureter analysis, restore the anatomy, and put the stent, see how she responds. Thank you. Uh, sir, one last question. Uh, this is regarding your presentation. Uh, wonderful metaculous dissection you have done re regarding the preserving the bowel, the sigmoid which you showed the video. And if we do the dissection laparoscopic of the endometriotic patches, what measures you take to prevent the adhesion formation post-operatively? Wait, another good question. And unfortunately, there is no measure proven to be effective. We do have interseed seprafem available in United States, which is approved. I know there are gels, hyaluronic acid gels. You have it in India and Europe. None of them have been proven to be effective, but on a case like this, I usually spray it with, with a tissue, which is capillary hemostatic and also creates a film. And also I would use seprafilm. Seprafilm is hard to apply laparoscopically, requires some skill. But that would be my preferred choice. Absolutely wonderful uh, discussion, sir. There are still many, many questions coming. But I know you have your prior commitment. And uh, we would love to hear from you very soon. Thank you for that participation. And I want to share with you, we have got 1,750 users logged in to hear live from the God of Lasers and use in endometriosis. Thank you, Thank Dr. Siena Nezdat, sir. It was a Thank wonderful you. time being with you. We are enthralled and mesmerized by your lecture. We will catch up with you soon. See you soon in India. Till then, Thank have a wonderful time. Thank you Thank so you much. Everybody. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Dachshu. Give my love to Cameron and Paul. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It was a wonderful lecture and we had a wonderful panelist interactions. We asked questions on sigmoid colon. We asked on the ureter. We asked questions on endometriomas and the wonderful robotic dissection and the dissection and use of CO2 laser. Thank you, Luminous, for getting that presentation from live Atlanta, Georgia. Now we are here, going to see and hear from our own Indian stalwarts. When I call upon Dr. Narendra Malotra, sir, to start his presentation, and we have got wonderful cases. These are the cases which they have dealt with, and they would like to share with you their experience. And this is amazing. Battling with fibroids. I hand over the mic to Dr. Narendra Malotra. Thank you, Niranjan. Uh, from endometriosis, we go to the other uh, of the big three, or the rather what I call big four diseases, which women have. Endometriosis, fibroids, and PCO, the big three, and uh, which cause infertility. So battling fibroids was what I was told, and how I would medically manage them if they refuse surgery. So here was my case, which was about 26 year old, Nali Paris, uh, recently married and came to us with pelvic pain and heavy menstrual bleed since last four or five months. And uh, she was previously put on OCPs by uh, general practitioners and some painkillers, but not recently. And she is not willing for any surgery. And she was anxious for conception. She also had some vitamin D deficiency, which most of the Indian women have. Uh, well, she was normally built, no pallor, pulse, BP, everything was normal, no guarding. And when we did a PV examination, we found the uterus was a little bit firm and there was a palpable posterior mass. When I did a scan, here is what we saw. A big fibroid extending right from near the cavity to the serosa. Complete intramural fibroid by about 5 by 4 by 3. 
and uh, this my first choice of would have been surgery i again tried to tell her that you want to get conceived it's going right to your through and through and it it uh, merits for a surgical removal as a small than four uh, size so my first choice would have been surgery but since she refused and since i told her that if you have medical treatment you'll have to wait for some time to get pregnant so you'll have to wait for a at least a minimum of 12 to 12 weeks before we can get the size reduced and then maybe you could try and then of course you have to counsel her that the fibroid may start growing again so well looking at her age in child bearing and all uh, then i uh, looked and the expectant she would have got pregnant but would have aborted or would have growth retardation and the others and we of course uh, opted for a, a definitive treatment since she refused surgery i was left with only a medical treatment so medically i could have handled her non hormonally or with the others others or hormonally so my algorithm for a medical management of fibroid would be asymptomatic symptomatic then the size and then i would go in for whether they want pregnancy and then go in and give them the treatment and today we know that we have a good medical uh, treatment available with us selective progesterone receptor modulators we have to understand that both endometriosis and fibroids now you have two types of progesterone receptors pra Uh, a and prb and then you have to modulate these receptors so that they don't grow she was already put on ocps so we did not try that we did not want to give her agonist because uh, short term treatment other thing we did not give her progestons obviously levonorgestrel would have worked because it was coming near the this thing but uh, she did not want an iucd also so looking at the receptors we decided to put her on a sperm and uh, these uh, the first one which i chose was uliprostal which was very popular then went off because of some liver diseases so you got to monitor this so the standard 5 mg daily dose for a 12 week regime added vitamin d because she was deficient uh, initially daily and then the weekly dose it is an orally acting drug and it works on the fibroids uh, by uh, proactive anti proliferative action so it decreases the tnf expression and decreases the size and volume it works by the hpo axis inhibits ovulation and it works on the endometrium so you get less bleeding and inhibits but if she wants to conceive then of course she has to go in for a surgical treatment and an ovulation induction so we started 5 mg od first week of menstruation continued for 3 months and various evidence of the pearl 1 2 3 4 studies uh, showed that this uh, treatment does work and this paper refers uh, to how the fibroids would decrease in this size and when you stop the treatment they conceive and how the fibroids did not grow to that size uh, which we thought it was and they, they were followed by the mri so my algorithm were followed this uh, 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 paper which uh, was published in fertility uh, sterility and this is how i handled this case uh, the 12 weeks are over this week for this patient now i'm going to pull her out of fibroid after she had to do a scan to see how much it has reduced if it has not worked then of course surgery and uh, pregnancy tried for pregnancy if it has worked then i give her a chance for spontaneous conception for the next 3 to 4 months and if she still doesn't conceive then we go ahead and manage uh, infertility accordingly so that is how i would manage a case uh, of a 4 to 5 cm fibroid uh, patient who does not want surgery amazing amazing battling with fibroids and i appreciate the way you have explained sir and we usually get such cases in our practice where we are in a dilemma and laparoscopy is not the issue it is nothing to do with endoscopy and you have to remember that just because you are an endoscopist you just have to put your scope 
and i think dr narendra sir's magic of explaining the way he has tackled this case is amazing and i want to tell you we have crossed at 1976 users not only from india but pan india from nepal from sri lanka south east asian countries and trans atlantic amazing and europe thank you so much sir yeah we had propagated this in our cefog and all the country representatives of cefog were asked to send it to all their countries so seven countries i am responsible thank you thank you so much sir and i want to congratulate you today it's a very big day in your life i just came to know from you and the other sources that you have been elected the president of rotary club of agra amazing you are a man on a mission and the energy which you have i think nobody can compare it thank, thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you so much uh, we go to the next presenter now and i call upon dr nozer sharia sir to present his slides and it's endometriosis we know it is enigmatic but now it is elusive dr nozer sharia the mic is yours uh, thank you thank you niranjan a uh, real privilege to be part of this panel uh, cnn and nazat's lecture i think you could have just stopped after that and this would have been one of the finest webinars ever uh congratulations narendra always great to know that there's so much energy you have for so many things you do niranjan congratulations you. uh you have a lot of responsibility on your shoulders now in foxy now first i must thank uh, uh niranjan and science integra because this is a case that was was prepared and i've been given some questions um so It, it it's an illustrative case it's something we all deal with in our day to day practice now very aptly it was called elusive endometriosis and many years ago we edited a monogram on endometriosis of tusha krishna and i and uh, in the preface we quoted a small uh, quote from the book scarlet pimpernel scarlet pimpernel was a person who was an english uh, nobleman He used to wear all kinds of disguises and go to France and save people during the French Revolution. Endometriosis wears all kinds of disguises, and I think Sienna's presentation has shown that beautifully. You no, know, they said they search him here, they search him there, they search him everywhere. Is he in heaven? Heaven is he in hell? That damn elusive pimpernel. And we are going to talk today about this elusive endometriosis. This is a young woman. She is married, twenty-four. She has a history of severe pelvic pain. I assume that it started off with dysmenorrhea, and it's either it peaks around menstruation, usually clears immediately after, but at some point in time it kind of strays into the intermenstrual period. I just got a call this afternoon from a patient of mine who could fit this picture. The only thing is she wasn't married. Uh, severe pain, struggling for a long time. Uh, she's on medical treatment, and that probably is what I'm going to talk about today. she has taken over the counter nsaids and of course nsaids are the first line treatment evidence says that using nsaids mefenimic acid ibuprofen or sometimes combination medications will usually help and my counseling to women and let's face it today we are seeing younger and younger women with endometriosis is to use it prophylactically most women use nsaids therapeutically and it is too little too late now here is a patient who says she doesn't want surgery for whatever the pain there is and she's concerned about her long term fertility could I have the next slide please uh everything is fine in a vital parameters next slide please and this is the ultrasound picture now the ultrasound picture the nickel exam would reveal uh in the examination is done sexually active married woman that a mass was felt next to the uterus appearance from trioma and mimic an endometrioma the symptoms would be less marked though sometimes they can cause acute pain and most of the time if you tell the woman to be patient and wait two or three cycles that will disappear 
an endometrioma once it is present won't. So if someone tells you they had an endometrioma, it's now disappeared. It never was an endometrioma in the first place. Next slide, please. So the, next slide, please. So in this situation, I think our, our diagnosis is quite self-evident. This is an ovarian endometrioma, uh, probably uh, one of the commonest sites of endometriosis. Interestingly, most endometriomas are extra ovarian, which means they start off on the surface of the ovaries. The ovaries adhere into the ovarian fossa. As the endometrioma develops, it's actually pushing the capsule, the surface of the ovary inwards. So what you actually do when you're peeling off an endometrioma is working on the surface of the ovary. You keep this in mind, you can minimize damage during surgery. Patient still says she'd prefer to avoid surgery. What do we do now? Well, here I'd like to give the logarithm that I would follow. Does she want fertility at this point or does she not want fertility? If she wants fertility, I would respect her wishes, give her pain relief and ask her to go ahead and try for fertility for the next three or four cycles and, and, and support her, maybe do a follicular study, help her pinpoint ovulation and tell her that if she is not pregnant within three or four cycles, surgery is probably going to be an excellent option for her. We know for sure that endometriomas themselves don't compromise ovarian function, but their presence and the fact they take up so much place in the ovary, particularly if they are bilateral, might. They also create a very hostile kind of... This woman doesn't want fertility. She either doesn't want fertility because she wants to postpone her first pregnancy, and it could be an older woman who wants long-term uh, uh, fertility control. Now, traditionally, what did we do? Traditionally, these patients who also wanted contraception were on a combined oral contraceptive pill. I would usually start off with a third generation pill with desogestrel and then move on to something with drosperinone because of its better profile. And I would always try and give them extended OCs, which means 42 days or 63 days at a time. I would tell and reassure her and say, you know what, you are going to suffer this pain. Let's try and minimize the frequency of the pain to six times or four times a year. Works extremely well. My experience is that when you go beyond 42 days with the seven-day break, then very often you deal with breakthrough bleeding. But I let each patient do this at the, on their own way. But then OCs have their issues and progesterogens are supposed to have a better profile when it comes to long-term medical management. Endometriomas, the primary management of an endometrioma is surgical. Let's get that right. If you want to cure an endometrioma, you have to operate. But there is enough evidence to show that if it's below five centimeters and if you can manage your symptoms, you can give her the option of medical treatment with very close monitoring. In this case, in the past, medroxyprogesterone was recommended, but for me, that's not really a good idea. The doses were large, large doses of progesterogens after sometimes start creating a lot of other issues in the women. They make them uncomfortable, emotional issues, cosmetic issues, weight issues, not my preference. Of in the past, when I didn't have the other option available, I used to use depomedroxyprogesterone acetate. This woman wants contraception. She needs the progesterogen. But again, you know that long-term use of depomedroxyprogesterone acetate had certain issues. And so while it's a great way of managing the endometrioma, particularly in a woman who wants laugh, it will kind of slow the disease down. Not the first choice. Uh, these women for medical management need to be monitored regularly at six monthly intervals. Now that's where when the molecule of Dinogis became available to us, it probably immediately took over the management, the medical management of endometriosis with a progesterogen. Okay, so progesterogens have their benefits. I always reassure patients and tell them progesterogens are the hormone of pregnancy. They are safe. It's two milligrams every day. And you can have them on an extended basis for as long as you need. Studies have usually studied them for 48 months, 72 months. But I think there's enough experience now and evidence to show that you do not need to stop the progesterogen once it is used. Monitoring every six months, an ultrasound. 
She's told to report back if her symptoms kind of get out of hand, but it's got great relief as far as symptoms are concerned. And there are two red lines. The first red line is if there is symptoms which are severe in spite of the medication. And the second is if she suddenly finds a growth of a significant amount, which doesn't normally happen, then you probably need to tell her that if that happens, we're going for surgical treatment. Uh, safety, extremely safe. There's enough, again, evidence to show the safety of progesterogens, particularly something like Dinogest. And again, uh, the main side effect that you have to be able to deal with is amenorrhea, which actually is not such a bad thing for these patients, and sometimes irregular bleeding. Now, how do you deal with that? For me, it is now become something, it's almost an art for a gynecologist to convince a woman that it's all right to be amenorrhea. And with more and more use of progesterogens and LARC, we have to do this more often. Women have been conditioned to believe that menstruation has to be regular and monthly and nothing can be further from the truth. The first line for the woman that I will put out is menstruating regularly is abnormal. Now, the moment I say that you've got her attention and then you explain to her that regular menstruation has just happened in the last 60 years of human existence and for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years women didn't menstruate because they spend their lives pregnant or breastfeeding which is using a progesterogen we are what would have happened then few periods irregular uh, occasional periods now this is for me what i will use still maybe such time she plans for fertility at which point i stop the medication again give a force to conceive after which if she doesn't conceive that go for surgery are there any alternatives yes there are levonorgestrel means that this is the treatment for an ovarian endometrioma i've heard people say that they used the lng ius and the ovarian endometrial disappeared that was not an ovarian endometrioma. It can't work on one and ovarian endometrioma. Implants will probably help. And I've got one patient waiting to go in for an implant because she has not tolerated oral medication. And implants are available now. Think about them as an option, as an alternative. And finally, two other options. Because we need more than one thing in our, on our palate if you're going to paint the painting. One, aromatase inhibitors, letrozole in a dose of 2.5 milligrams long term has shown effect. At the end of it, you want anovulation and hypomenorrhea as safely as possible. And I have used mifepristone. I usually start with 25 milligrams for two months and then bring them down to 10 milligrams. That's what the patient I had today had. Unfortunately, a liver function has gotten messed up. I've stopped. So just to, re uh, to recap, medical management, yes, if the patient wants it. After you document that you tell her that this is going to be management to take care of your symptoms, but it's not going to solve your problem. If that problem needs solving for fertility or because symptoms recur, surgery, ovarian cystectomy is a safe surgery. If done well, it will not do unnecessary damage to the ovaries if it's done by a skilled laparoscopist. Secondly, treatment of GnRH analogs, yes, I sometimes start off with them. If it's really bad and after three to six months, pass the baton on to uh, progesterogens. Progesterogens, Dinogest would probably score over the others and pref would be my preference now. Now, finally, I have just one concern. A woman wants contraception and I want to put on to Dinogest. And as of now, nowhere is it written that Dinogest works as a contraceptive. Though it would. Remember, it would. If Desogestrel can work as a progesterogen-only contraceptive, Dinogest should work as a progesterogen-only contraceptive. But since I have this concern, I then, for those you women, use the COC with Dinogest, which we have it available with ethanol, estradiol, and 2 milligrams of Dinogest. Great alternative. I get the benefit of Dinogest. I get the benefit of a COC. I give a long-term use. I get cosmetic benefit. And those women, again, do quite well with that. Uh, what you love today is we have options. What we love today is today, Niranjan, you in this particular webinar are presenting people with options. Now, people have to individualize these options to benefit individual patients. And I think that's the most exciting 
and challenging things there is for us. Remember, Sherlock Holmes was a uh, uh, was 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 created by a doctor. Okay, and and but Doctor uh, Arthur Conan. I like we we so, so I, for us it's great. You know, we we Conan do Doyle. Absolutely. Thank you, Niranjan. Thank you for this opportunity to present my thoughts Absolutely. and thought process yeah. to people. Sir, when you were speaking after the case presentation and you have gone through the whole journey of endometriosis, you have answered all the questions. I don't have to ask you any questions, but I would like to take and those doctors who have asked Dr. Harpreet Kaur, who has asked the role of mephipristone, which you have already discussed. There's one Dr. Sushmita Mitra, which you have talked about luprolide, you have talked about levonorgestrel, you have talked about also use of dinogest and dihydrogestron. So I think, sir, you have covered there. Dr. Narendra, so please unmute your mic. But till then, we will go to Dr. Manjula Anagani, the lady from South India and a Padma Shri holder. Please Thank go ahead with you. your wonderful case of tackling AUB. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Nazar was talking about enigmatic endometriosis. I was remembering we did one conference in Hyderabad, and we all know that Salajang Museum is the best museum in the world. And we have this uh, woman standing, which is like it shows a woman in the back and the man in the front. It's a famous statue which is there. It's endometriosis is always like that. It shows something, it is something, it presents something. So coming to the commonest complicated presentation of any woman coming to any gynecologist, that is abnormal uterine bleeding. So here we have a case of Mrs. Uh, XYZ, 42-year-old multiparous woman presented to the clinic with heavy menstrual bleeding since past six months. So we have a lady which is now going into chronic AUB. Once we cross, by definition, more than six cycles of heavy menstrual bleeding, it is now called as chronic abnormal uterine bleeding. So the bleeding here for this lady lasts for eight days with passage of clots. And we do know menstrual blood do not clot once it is clotting that means yes it is heavy menstrual bleeding and she has a past regular menstrual cycle of 28 days and she did not have any intermenstrual or postcoital bleeding so she did not have any other bubble bladder symptoms otherwise fit well without any major comorbidities of medical or surgical and family is also history is also significant so these are the few points that are very important for us when everyone comes to us the duration of it and the comorbidities which go and the age of the woman with uh, with the with especially the essence towards her fertility status and what she wants to do with her fertility status and uh, next slide please so on examination except pala because of six months of bleeding which is very very important for us because anemia itself can lead to uh, polymenorrhagia or ex uh, abnormal uterine bleeding and abnormal uterine bleeding can again lead to the pallor part of it which she is having and the blood pressure is 140 90 the rest of the systems which can actually be there once she comes to a doctor most of the time we do see the blood pressure becomes 150 90 once she comes to a clinic so rest of the things apparently look normal next please Copper abdomen, absolutely no mass is palpated. Per speculum, there's a large volume of clot which is coming out of the cervical os, means she's still bleeding. And then per vaginal examination, except that uterus is bulky and actually obstetric history is not given. It looks it's a Paris woman, which is thus hence the uterus bulky does not have much of a meaning with Paris woman. And hemoglobin of 8.5, which is significant, and TLC and INR is perfectly normal, 0.8. So her she doesn't have any by history itself. We know that the with the FIGO uh, nomenclature which we have, that is very important to uh, avoid the inconsistency in the nomenclature which we have and we all in the world can talk about the same thing at the same time. So by history, we have ruled out there is no coagulopathy. So AUBC is ruled out, thyroid is normal, 2.58 and the scan, next please. The pap smear is normal and ultrasound shows endometrium of 6 mm and bilateral adnexia normal. So apparently by the three tests which we do when an AUB patient comes, by history we have ruled out AUBC and we have also ruled out AUBN because there is no um, an AUBI that is the iatrogenic cause. She's not on any medical management or medical medication which can cause the bleeding. So when we do the ultrasound picture and apparently the whole thing normal and without any uh, space occupying lesion or structure and abnormality we have ruled out adenomyosis we have ruled out endometriosis we have ruled out fibroids and polyp so what we have in front of us is a 42 year old lady which is with an abnormal uterine bleeding 
and presenting to us with uh, more than six months of duration. So we have in front of us uh, with the family history, if there is a high risk woman like obesity or anything, I would be doing a DNC for her to rule out any hyperplasia. If hyperplasia is not there, and then I would label her as AUBO or AUBE. So these are the two diagnoses. And for this lady, the diagnosis right now lands with AUBO and AUBE. The management in AUBO and AUBE is the same. So we are looking at either COCs or a norethistone as a first line of management in these women. And 42 years is a young enough lady with a lot, lot of uh, normal life to be looking forward with a new, new uh, I think, youth which is entering. So I think the first line, line of general, when we discuss with the woman, and we've been talking about the side effect profile of medication and how we should go about with it. My first line of the drug of choice would always be norethistron because we do know with COCs, the side effects are mostly because of the estrogen content in it. And when we are looking at COCs, we are looking, looking at the HPO axis being stopped and anovulation in the first part. The minute we stop it, again, the whole thing is going to come back to the same thing. And we also have to look at the clotting diathesis which the patient might have. Or we do have, because I've been with the corporates for such a long time, I have seen people coming with the upper limb and lower limb thrombosis even with the first cycle of COCs which they have come. So because of this, and the second reason is with, this, uh, with the patient psychology of um, uh, OCs and the side effects, my drug of choice, my treatment of choice is always been norethistron as a first. So when we are looking at norethistron, we do know that it is the most potent progesterone. Progesterone has acts through either progesterogenic receptors or mineralocorticoid receptors or androgenic receptors or glucocorticoid receptors. Depending on it, the side effect, the effect profile will be there. In an AUB, we are looking at what is the problem. The problem lies with estrogen progesterone harmony, which is gone, and the receptors, which is the A and B. And it's the B which is not exactly acting well, and the A is inhibiting the progesterone receptor B, which is there. So when we are looking at it, the common sense prevails is that the estrogen is normal. So we have to give the opposite hormone that is a progesterone and the best progesterone of choice would be a potent synthetic progesterone, which would be acting at the um, progesterone receptor B and creating the effect which we would like to have. So that would be the norethistone. So we also have used over time that medical curatage is nothing but progesterone induced withdrawal and the bleeding which can happen so norethistron the dosages which people have given are various dosages which is not the drug of choice and the cyclical progesterone it should not be used so the actual way of using norethistron is starting from the fifth day of the cycle mimicking the what we want in the thing and giving it for 21 days. So doing this for three to six cycles is the minimum which I would do in my clinical practice. And the dose we have found it very, very effective and the way, the way it acts is 10 milligrams per day or sometimes if it's in an acute phase where the bleeding is too much, we would start with 10 milligrams twice a day and then continue for 21 days. And from the next cycle, it will be 10, 10 milligrams per day for 21 days, starting from fifth day of the cycle. Giving it from the luteal phase do not help the situation because the HPO axis is active and the wave of FSH LH acting and the two waves which has to start with the inherent progesterone receptor starts acting. So in an AUBO, the treatment profile should be norethistrone starting from a fifth day of cycle, 10 milligrams a day for 21 days for about three to six months and then reassess the situation after six cycles and then project, go ahead along with it. If the other mo modalities which can be effective in these cases would definitely be uh, levonorgestrel IUCD. But when a woman is already having an AUB, uh, the associated intermittent spotting which goes for about three to six months, if it is not counseled properly, she might not take well because he or she does not have intermittent spot. Her, uh, cycles have been regular. So she, depending on the patient psychology and when we do the counseling regarding how it is going to be in a short term versus long term effects and the need of contraception, we can give her the option of COC, norethistron and the levonorgestrel IUD in this case. And if she chooses the uh, most of the time, my patients always choose, let me try medical first, then only I would go for anything, even if it is a minimally invasive like levonorgestrel. So we would use norethistrone, and the most of the time, within six cycles, their AUB is well under control. Thank you, uh, Manjula. You have done a wonderful job explaining, and it was such a nice presentation of yours. Uh, 
Uh, well, we will come back to you. There are a lot of questions being asked by the audience, and I want to tell you all of you. After you coming there as Indian panelist, the, the count has gone more than two thousand. And I request Dr. Narendra Malhotra, sir, please to join us. In the meantime, I will be asking a question to Dr. Nozar Sherryar, sir. Uh, sir, you talked about using COC, so there is a question pertaining to that. by dr harpreet kaur since coc contains estrogen will it not increase the endometriosis lesion and one more question is by dr sushila she has also asked you the same endometriosis is already a hyper estrogenic condition so giving coc that is dynogest plus e instead of dynogest will it not worsen the disease sir so please your answer on that okay so so basically if we go back to how cocs work cocs work by suppressing ovulation and cocs work by suppressing the endometrium and the endometrial thickness as one of their modes of action remember cocs are substituting your physiological levels of estrogen with a much lower therapeutic level of estrogen so cocs in fact have long been considered to be acceptable acceptable medical treatment for endometriosis the only thing you have to do here is you have to use cocs in an extended manner to keep the endometrial lining suppressed and its effect on endometriosis particularly when it comes to surface endometriosis is well documented as i said earlier unfortunately the effect on ovarian endometriosis will only be symptomatic as also its effect on recto vaginal endometriosis so in these two conditions we are probably better better of looking at an alternative okay okay then i think that is a, a wonderful answer you have given uh, so there are many questions but i will come back to you soon dr manjula anangani yes, uh, i just came to know Dr Narendra Malhotra has to go and join another webinar at 8:30 so this is the question regarding fibroid obviously you have tackled such nicely the aub right uh, there are hardly any questions on that but once we get we will surely get back to you on that uh, point of uh, aub uh, mm -hmm. madam yes sir till what amount of the size of fibroid can we give a medical line of treatment what is your take on that usually in my uh, practice we and medical management are using two different scenarios very clearly one is the post laparoscopy surgery where there are seedling fibroids smaller smaller ones and the patient starts getting hyper about mere ko pura fibroids nahi nikala tode reh gaya those are the times when any way post man surgery i would be using second time type when i will be using is the perimenopausal people who will have is ultrasound picture about 2 cm 3 cm and they are very hyper about it again without any symptoms also but it is affecting their psychological psyche of it these are the used till two times when we give but till 3 cm we have used and then yes we might have only 40 to 50% reduction of the size of it and the center of it because of the lysis of the like uh, dr narendra very clearly told how it affects the receptors inside and it the level of the thing so it becomes necrosed inside so it becomes gooey gooey inside so it just the size comes down because of the necrosis inside to about 40% but the symptoms come down naturally because of the softness and with which it goes so 3 to 4 cm is the time when we look at uh, managing it medically okay okay fine uh sir uh one more question is to you this is regarding uh one minute sir how much uh, duration you give dynogest this is one question which has been asked and how safely it is to prescribe dr ayona can it can you give it for years together Dr. Yeah. Nazar. So, so first of all, can I just supplement something that Manjula said earlier? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. amazing how patients teach us so much. So, a very dear friend of ours many years ago uh, came to me. She was in her mid forties, I think she was forty-five. Uh, she had very large fibroids, and she had gone to a doctor, and she was told that she would be best served by hysterectomy. She was in a state of shock. After everything was discussed, we counselled her. Her fibroids. Had a uterus that was larger than almost 24 weeks plus, 
and we took the decision to put her on ulipristal it worked brilliantly uh significant reduction size no symptoms she continued on the medicine for quite some time till she finally became menopausal since then i have a series of patients where this is an option women who've had multiple surgeries in the past who don't want to go through one more myomectomy women who are not married and who are in their 40s professional women who don't want to lose their uterus and would prefer to avoid a surgery this is an option which you have to give to the woman after adequate counseling discussion and documentation and in my experience it's worked brilliantly in most cases i have used them for a lot i have used ulipristal for extended times i have patients where i've had ulipristal on for more than 2 and even 3 years the patient is told about the risks of ulipristal the patient is monitored absolutely you know with 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 liver function between every every course of ulipristal her endometrial thickness is monitored and i think uh, i know that there is a very paranoid kind of a reaction because of what happened in europe but as happened with mosilators in the us let's keep our balance let's be safe let's keep our patients involved in these decisions and these are great drugs they are great options great alternatives use them same with dinogest there is no you know like i said if you go by scientific research studies report 48 months 72 months but i don't think there is any upper limit for progestogens as i believe there is no upper limit for combined oral contraceptives so i will often again discuss with patients why they are taking the medication why it is safe what they need to monitor and once patients get comfortable with them i often tell them it's like telling someone where you just don't do that she can safely stay on it for a very long time make sure that you keep her coming in make sure that you keep monitoring her for my satisfaction this patient will have a periodic liver function done i discuss the effect on bone and bone density in patients who are on long term progestogens particularly if it's injectables i have done dexa scans for women over years i have used dmpa for patients for even 10 years and trust me for a woman who is careful for a woman who exercises who is told about weight bearing exercise i have seen no big change in the bone density weight is an issue for some women again if a woman is particular and she uses these medications and does her lifestyle changes you don't even really need to worry about weight so so don't worry about long term use of desogestrel give it to her as long as she needs it because if she needs it now she will need it after a few years until something else changes dramatically so i just want to make an extra point uh, sir uh, you said aptly very very correct the way it has to be used there are so many studies which have said till 7 years they have used but in endometriosis one thing what we have to tell them is till the girl thinks of pregnancy let her continue like sir said it can be 10 years we start this around 16 years if she wants to conceive at 28 years perfect but she the disease has to be under suppression because we have to remember the recurrence rates are very very high so dinogest or cocs please continue till she thinks of pregnancy yeah, yeah. yeah. so so uh, yeah. so when we when we talk about the non contraceptive benefits of coc this takes me to the previous question asked to me there is no doubt that use of cocs reduce functional ovarian cysts statistical significance in the reduction in ovarian endometriomas and now we also know that there is a reduced risk of ovarian cancer so all these benefits also need to be given to women when they are on cocs we've started them for young girls sometimes in their late adolescence you know nowadays we've seen in large endometriomas even in adolescents even in girls before 20 the the girl is comfortable the mother is always uncomfortable and comes every 6 months or one year and says can she get off it can she get off it and you have to make her understand that these medications are serving a purpose you are reducing the recurrence risk definitely uh with fibroids maybe you may not so it works differently with fibroids and differently with endometriosis but again just to supplement what manjula said i i have i have some women i have a young unmarried girl i operated on her when she was 22 23 35 fibroids and now she's 30 and this is a young girl very ordinary means very conservative family dmpa for her for the last 7 years and some have kept now i know we say that progestogens 
have a role to play in growing fibroids and that's why we use selective progesterone modulators but trust me if you are suppressing ovulation any which way and i didn't have the alternatives back then i didn't have the alternatives which we have now 7 or 8 years ago so we keep up abreast with what is available we keep changing from time to time but the principle doesn't change if something is going to benefit her she has to be willing to take it for the very long term till she doesn't need to take it when the situation changes thank you thank you both of you it was a wonderful presentation and the case discussions there are still questions sir last question i am asking to you sir what are the markers to check if the endometriosis is changing to malignancy does it change to malignancy this is by dr varda ashmat yeah so firstly let's let's face it while uh, with both fibroids and endometriosis i think we are generally fortunate that the incidence of malignant change is low it is always a possibility and like we say in medicine if the mind doesn't know it the eyes don't see it you have to keep it somewhere at the back of mind and you've got to draw certain red lines for the patient and for yourself uh, firstly if there is a doubt and and if you feel that this is looking on an ultrasound not like we normally expect now when what what do we normally expect an endometrioma to have an endometria normally has its typical high resistance uh, has a high resistance blood flow okay very often the vascularity within the endometrioma is not great whereas if you have something suspicious the first thing that will happen is hypervascularity and mri would probably help you differentiate but for me the biggest red line would be a sudden change in size so i would normally have these women or girls coming in once in 6 months just for a chat just to really encourage them and tell them please go on with the medications to evaluate the size and make sure nothing is changing and 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 if and if there is a doubt she goes for surgery and if there is a doubt the surgery must be done the way you would do for a suspicion ovarian mass with a frozen section on standby and preparedness for whatever else is required to be done okay so so i appreciate that question because it 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 brings to mind to all the people who are viewing today don't forget that you can have and an ovarian carcinoma which has its beginnings in what started off as endometriosis is rare but definitely possible amazing i think, I think yes yes dr uh, manjula point, the whole thing is about the etiopathogenesis we do know now that it is the edcs that the endocrine disruptive chemicals which are the cause for increasing endometriosis and the same thing holds true for the malignancies inside which is continuously they are exposed to a dioxin dioxins so i think we have to look at it like sir says or any feature which is suggestive of you no know, lack of uh, ground glass appearance and increasing in size and vascularity these are three points and the ca125 also but you know how to take it take it with a pinch of salt when it comes to endometriosis so that is important for us to think and i'm not going to leave you now one more question to you last that is the last yes sir how about tranexamic mefenamic as she has not tried why not medroxy progesterone on a regular basis and norethesterone only to stop acute uncontrolled bleeding this is dr shamla guru vare the so first thing is yes when we talk about uh, our treatment of aub it is uh, hormonal non hormonal with the way we have to describe and then nsaids the first two three days of the cycle when we have to use we can always use um, uh, tranexa with the methanamic acid for three four days for two three cycles if she is very happy with that with the amount of flow and the uh, thing is coming down that can be definitely used in both ways once we know it is an acute phase where the continuous bleeding is not coming under control that's when the norat progesterone comes in and when it comes to medroxy progesterone it is a very weak progesterone it is a natural progesterone which is like it's a synthetic progesterone which acts on progesterogenic receptors i'm sorry it is not a natural progesterone it is a synthetic progesterone which acts on progesterogenic proge receptors which is a very weak progesterone like dr nazer already told you that the dose we need to control the bleeding when it comes to medroxy progesterone is as high as 60 160 mg sometimes so 32 it goes up the more the dosage of progesterone which we are using the more the effect on the hdl which will decrease and the more the effect on the even the clotting factors so we have to look at what is the most potent progesterone which acts on it 
and with the lowest dose possible that will be the norethistron so it has to be 10 mg twice a day or a single dose or from fifth day for 21 days this is a case of aub which is not responding to the nsaids plus tranexam so i think first to first you can always choose choose this and that thank you thank you so much dr manjula we have got many questions but i think it's the time to close dr nusrat from dhaka bangladesh is asking i couldn't see this wonderful webinar today missed due to network would love to see it somewhere dr nusrat don't worry we are going to be here in one or two days you will see those video on youtube science integra channel and i would like to thank now and end this program what a wonderful way the presenters our indian panelist and thank you dr narendra malhotra sir dr nozer sheriyar sir and manjula madam the way you have taken us and expressed your views and given a wonderful basket of medicines and surgery to be given on our patients and to be very sure individualize this case well we had dr c n anezat also who talked on co2 lasers and its use and he compared with the monopolar the bipolar cautery and the jet plasma he has also devised the nezat advisory app which has been recently launched and it has a qr code you can go on that and find out they have also the free online uh, uh, free online nezat books which have been written by sir and his brothers amazing i think today's webinar was the wonderful thing the highlight of highlights of all tog webinars we have we had a users of 2000 and 2112 so it's amazing and i would like to thank our sponsors especially alembic who has been there with us supporting this wonderful cause knowledge beyond boundaries episode number 5 thank you for being with science and educating and parting this education consistently and of course luminous nothing works without us coming together team work is the ability to work together towards the common vision and the ability to direct individual accomplishments towards organizational objectives it is that fuel that allows common people to attain uncommon results and with this i would like to take a bow your host of tog dr niranjan chawan and thank all of you shabba khair shubh ratri khuda hafiz phir milenge thank, thank you. you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you all doctors thank you so much Thank you doctors thank you so much thanks bye bye thank you thanks everyone thank you dr niranjan especially for giving us this platform and we look forward for more such uh, uh, cooperation uh, yes, thank you thank you, thank thank you so much you. good night good thank night, you sir thank you good night bye bye thank you bye bye everyone bye bye thank you